A small mistake by an engineer could lead to the collapse of the world's largest dam. When cement comes into contact with water, it generates heat. As it dries, its temperature rises even further. Now imagine building a massive dam that requires millions of tons of concrete and cement. If the cement isn't cooled properly, no matter how large or strong the dam is, cracks will start appearing within a week, eventually leading to its collapse. We will discuss the major challenges engineers face while constructing the world's largest dam, the Three Gorges Dam. This dam is built on the Yangtze River in China. It became fully operational in 2012 and was designed using highly advanced engineering, giving it an estimated lifespan of around 100 years. When operating at full capacity, this dam generates 22,500 megawatts of electricity, making it the largest hydroelectric power-producing dam in the world. The dam has a total length of 2.33 kilometers and houses 32 generators for power generation, along with two additional generators that supply electricity at the local level. First, let's discuss the construction of the dam. When building a dam on a flowing river, it's crucial to control the water flow. If the river is small, the water is diverted to the side and a coffer dam is constructed. This coffer dam completely blocks the water in that section, drying up the area and making it suitable for construction. However, in the case of the Three Gorges Dam, the Yangtze River spans approximately 1.5 kilometers in width. To control the immense water flow, the dam's length was extended to 2.3 kilometers. Since diverting such a massive volume of water was impossible, Engineers devised another solution, dividing the dam into three sections. Two sections were built first, while the remaining one was constructed later. To manage the water flow, engineers built a temporary structure called a coffer dam. This was created by pouring soil and rocks into the river and placing large steel boxes filled with stones to block the water. To further strengthen it, the structure was reinforced with cement and concrete. This was essential because the river had a history of frequent flooding, and engineers needed to ensure that strong currents wouldn't disrupt the construction process. After the coffer dam was completed, excavation of the riverbed began. This continued until engineers reached a solid bedrock layer, which was located at a depth of approximately 40 to 50 meters. With the bedrock layer identified, the next challenge was ensuring the foundation's stability against earthquakes. If an earthquake caused cracks in the foundation, water could seep through, potentially leading to the dam's collapse. To prevent this, any cracks in the bedrock were sealed using cement and chemical grouting. For instance, if water leakage is detected in a weak rock layer, horizontal drilling machines are used to create openings in an area. A high-pressure mixture of cement and chemical grout is then injected sealing the leaks and simultaneously reinforcing the foundation against earthquakes. One of the biggest challenges in dam construction is that water doesn't just flow on the surface. It also moves through multiple underground layers. Completely stopping its underground flow was nearly impossible. Instead of completely blocking the water, engineers devised another solution, allowing the water seeping through the foundation to flow in a controlled manner. To implement this solution, vertical boreholes were drilled into the bedrock layer. Water that previously moved slowly through underground layers now had a controlled exit through these boreholes. Since a single borehole couldn't drain all the water, multiple boreholes were drilled and connected to a centralized drainage system. Afterward, a grid pattern of steel reinforced bars was arranged, forming the foundation of the dam. The base of the Three Gorges Dam is 115 meters wide. Pouring such a massive amount of concrete and cement at once was risky, as cement generates heat when it comes into contact with water. As it dries, its temperature rises even further. This high temperature could cause cracks in the foundation, potentially leading to the dam's collapse within days, no matter its size. To prevent this, keeping the cement cool was essential. Therefore, all the construction materials, including concrete, stones, and water, were pre-cooled before use. Large cooling chambers were built on-site to cool the concrete and stones. Additionally, water was cooled before being mixed with cement. This helped regulate the temperature to some extent. Once the cement and concrete were mixed, they had to be transported to the foundation within 15 minutes. 
Conveyor belts were used to rapidly deliver the concrete to its designated spot. Any delay would cause the cement to start drying, weakening its bonding strength. However, the cooling process applied to the concrete was not entirely sufficient. All the previous measures were taken before the cement was poured. Therefore, maintaining cooling even after the foundation was constructed was equally essential. To solve this, the foundation construction process was modified. Instead of pouring the entire foundation at once, it was built in separate blocks. Once one block had dried, the next was constructed. Additionally, water sprays were used to keep the concrete and cement mixture cool. Water pipelines were also installed within the foundation, ensuring a continuous flow of cold water until the cement had fully set. Thus, the construction of the dam progressed gradually, and one side was successfully completed. Interestingly, the dam stands 175 meters tall, with a width of 40 meters at the top. Regular maintenance of the dam was crucial. To facilitate this, special galleries were constructed. Their primary function was to channel water seeping from the foundation in a controlled manner, while also providing access for maintenance and repairs. Once half of the dam was completed, it was time to remove the coffer dam. However, since it was built with strong concrete, controlled explosions were used for its demolition. Now it was time to construct the third and final section. However, the biggest challenge was managing the water flow. Engineers solved this issue by constructing 46 spillways to safely release excess water. These spillway channels were gradually opened, lowering the water level in a controlled manner. Once the water level dropped, large amounts of soil, rocks, and stone debris were deposited to raise the ground level. After that, a new concrete coffer dam was built to completely block the remaining water. Using the same construction process as the left section, the right section of the dam was also completed. Interestingly, a total of 280 million cubic meters of concrete was used in building this dam. Now it was time to demolish this coffer dam. It had to be removed carefully because if high pressure water suddenly exerted force on the dam, it could damage its structure. First, controlled openings were made in the dam to gradually increase the water pressure around it. Once enough water pressure was built up, controlled explosions using dynamite were carried out to demolish the coffer dam. But do you think building the dam was that easy? The real challenges were just beginning. The first major challenge was that this region was one of the busiest waterways in the world, with frequent traffic from large cargo ships. China couldn't afford to build a dam that would disrupt its trade routes, so engineers devised an ingenious solution. To ensure large cargo ships could pass, engineers built a special five-stage ship-locking mechanism. Each stage of the system was 280 meters long and 34 meters wide, allowing large cargo ships to pass through smoothly. For example, when a cargo ship arrives, it enters the first stage and the gate is locked behind it. Next, water from the second stage is released into the first stage through sliding gates at the bottom. This gradually raises the water level to the first stage, lifting the ship upward. Once the water levels in both stages are equal, the second stage gate opens, allowing the ship to move forward. This process is repeated until the ship successfully crosses the entire dam. However, there was a major drawback. It took four hours for a ship to reach the required height. If a cruise ship was passing through, Passengers, especially couples, would spend most of their time waiting in the ship lock system instead of enjoying the journey. To solve this, engineers devised another solution. They designed the world's most powerful ship lift, capable of lifting an entire ship vertically in minutes. Remarkably, this is the world's most powerful ship lift, capable of lifting up to 3,000 tons. When a ship arrives, it enters a designated chamber, which is then securely locked. This ship lift has a total length of 120 meters and a width of 18 meters. The entire ship chamber is then lifted upward. Heavy ropes attached to both sides are connected to a powerful pulley system. To maintain stability, heavy counterweights are placed on the opposite side of the lift. In reality, a powerful hydraulic motor system is installed directly on the ship chamber to lift it, and its working mechanism is truly fascinating. 
The motor system is installed at four points on the chamber. These motors drive a pulley system that rotates a worm gear, which moves along treaded rails, generating the force needed to lift the ship chamber. It functions similarly to a nut and bolt mechanism. One of the best features of the worm gear is that even if a rope snaps, the lift will stop and won't fall, as this gear system ensures unidirectional power transfer. Now let's simplify this concept. In a regular gear system, any gear can rotate another gear in both directions. However, in a worm gear system, only the worm gear can rotate the ring gear. But the ring gear cannot rotate the worm gear in reverse, no matter how much force is applied. This is exactly how the ship lift system works. Now you might wonder, if the worm gear itself can lift the system, then why are ropes needed at all? In reality, the worm gear provides the lifting force, while the ropes and counterweights bear the actual weight of the lift. It's similar to how a car engine doesn't support the car's weight, but only moves it forward or in reverse while the tires bear the actual load. Now another critical issue arises, what if a rope snaps? If that happens, the entire lift could crash down because the worm gear alone cannot handle such a heavy load. To prevent such emergency failures, a rack system with teeth was designed. This rack is strong enough to support the entire weight of the lift. Below it, a locking mechanism engages with each tooth, securing the system in place. If a failure occurs and the lift begins to fall, this system instantly locks, preventing it from dropping even an inch. This lift raises the ship chamber to a height of 113 meters. Once the lift reaches the top, the gate opens, allowing the ship to continue forward. With this method, a ship can cross the dam in just 35 to 40 minutes. Now let's move on to the next major challenge. The next major challenge was that this dam is so massive that it stores water across an area of a thousand square kilometers. When the dam is at full capacity, it actually slows down Earth's rotation by six milliseconds. If this dam were to collapse at full capacity, it could put 300 million lives at risk. This massive volume of water exerts tremendous pressure, placing an enormous load on the dam. However, the real challenge arises when excess water overflows or needs to be released. As mentioned earlier, this dam stands at a height of 175 meters. When water overflows from such a great height, it can erode the dam's foundation, potentially leading to the collapse of the entire structure. To solve this issue, 46 ski jump spillways were constructed. Whenever water is released, these spillways throw the water 100 meters away from the dam, preventing any damage to the foundation. To control water release, Radial gates operated by hydraulic pumps were installed. These gates are opened or closed based on water flow requirements. However, engineers encountered a third major challenge, a significant environmental impact known as the sediment problem. As the river flows, it carries leaves, dead animals, waste, soil, and stones. When the water reaches the dam, these impurities and sediments accumulate, leading to serious environmental concerns. The first issue was that sediment accumulation gradually reduces the dam's water storage capacity. The second and more critical issue was that these sediments contain essential minerals that act as natural fertilizers for farmland. Many farmers near the river rely on its water for agriculture. However, while they still received water, it lacked essential minerals. As a result, they had to use more artificial fertilizers to maintain soil fertility. Chinese engineers anticipated this problem in advance. So they installed special sluice gates at the bottom of the dam, controlled by a hydraulic system. When excessive sediment builds up, these gates are opened, flushing the sediment out with the water, ensuring the minerals reach the farmlands. However, another challenge was that these sluice gates had to withstand extremely high water pressure. To handle this, the gates were designed like valves controlled by a hydraulic pump system that opens and closes them as needed. Now, let's move to the most crucial part of this dam, hydroelectric power generation. However, since power generation is a complex topic on its own, we will cover it in detail in part 2 of this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more amazing content. You can also join our channel membership to support us. Thank you for watching.